briefly. So my name is Wolf Gonterican, and I've been named, and I'm very proud to be named an honorary professor at University of Aberdeen several years ago. And thank you to Gerhard for for uh, sponsoring that. And um, what we've done twice this year, Samantha, as you know, is we've had uh, these online sessions. Where I think we looked at fintech, Samantha, didn't we last time? And yes. AI and lending and fintech. And that yes. was interesting. We had also a guest speaker with us uh, in addition to myself. And today we're going to be looking at ESG and really some investing issues around ESG. Dowie, who's joined us and will speak, I think, at 11. Hello, Dowie, you want to do a wave? Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Is truly an expert and is extremely passionate about ESG and sustainability and as a practitioner as well. So, uh, Dowie, a shout out to you and thank you for joining us. I'm going to finish at 55 past. Uh, and I'll just maybe, if, with everyone's permission, I'll go through some slides now. Um, my, my interest in ESG predated my my relationship with 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 Dowie. I started. Uh, I have a background in investing and in in, in risk management and 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 uh, trading. And it became pretty apparent uh, on the literature that I've been reading that there is a link between the outcomes of companies and to the extent that they wish to. Uh, adopt or follow sustainable practices and investment performance. And that investment performance can be at equity or debt levels. And I'll give you some real brief case studies now that I'll just pop up. And that's really what made me look at this space. Um, and we began thinking about it and talking with market experts, and we took it from there. So just bringing up the slides quickly now for the next 10 or 15 minutes. You, slideshow. Samantha, can you see ESG and in investing? Yes, all good. We can see everything. Okay, and uh, Gerhard would be very happy to know I have the right logo, apparently. Um, I didn't choose one of the wrong university's logos, so that's good. Um, so motivations for ESG investing, obviously, very much uh, is uh, focused on uh, not only doing good. Doing good is important, but from my lens as a practitioner is helping to manage risks, investment risks or credit risks or lending risks. And there's, a, there's, there's other drivers as well, improved financial returns. Uh, our clients, our investors demand it. Uh, my firm channel, where I'm CEO and chairman, has investors like uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, which used to be NNIP, Insight, Teachers, and others. And they all ask me for, um, so this is, these are stakeholders, uh, what is channel doing in terms of ESG? What type of commitments are we making and how do we integrate that in our processes? Um, it's not technically a fiduciary duty. I don't know, maybe Dowie would take take exception with me for that, or but that's certainly what this slide says as of 2021. But we we think it's it's not only doing right, but it's doing it's it's being smart. Motivations for integration in a firm includes improved long-term returns, brand image and reputation, decreasing investment risk, and meeting regulatory requirements, disclosure requirements, or otherwise. And that is now increasingly becoming an important job. Uh, in terms of meeting those requirements from a from a regulatory perspective, um, some a potted history, real briefly, is that um, you have Friedman, of course, looking in, in the background and thinking about companies and thinking about things from a shareholder, a shareholder perspective, not a stakeholder, but a shareholder perspective. What matters is maximizing shareholder returns, and and really what we saw then was in, during the 80s is really the emergence of Freeman and his approach of thinking about a broader set of stakeholders of a company. I'm just looking at a company and sort of who are the relevant parties. So you had to shift 70s to 80s, late 80s of understanding more who are the other stakeholders, employees, unions, clients, <laughs> how could you forget clients, regulators, suppliers of a company um, are all also important to consider when we're thinking about corporate performance and 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 who's who are the relevant stakeholders, and at the same time, SRI uh, was really coming on on online for different reasons and and maybe not linked to corporate corporate governance uh, related to apartheid, uh, shareholder activism, et cetera. And then what we saw in the '90s was really the emergence, the beginning emergence of impact investing. So impact investing is investing for a positive. E, S, or G impact, and possibly even accepting below market returns um, for that. Um, so that sort of was the emergence of impact investing, and that remains today. 
And what I think we've seen since those 90s is really emergence of ESG as a really critical area uh, to focus on, uh, whether you'd be large or small, in terms of uh, investing or taking risks in financial markets. Um, uh, not just having an impact, but also looking to maximize returns because firms that are aware of their ESG risks um, uh, generally will, will have a better understanding of their risk profiles. This is slide five, and this shows uh, complements of Sustainalytics and, and Brown Brothers Harriman um, that different, different financial products on the right. You have corporate equity and equity, just issue equity of a company. We have a corporate bond, so that's senior debt, an IOU with a promise. And then we have a securitized bond, which is securitizing. We'll look at that in a minute um, um, and issuing a securitization as a company. And what's interesting is when you have a severe ESG incident, these, these parties believe the drawdown, uh, and this is something Gerhard would understand, the volatility of that instrument post the ESG event is very significant for equity, is kind of significant for a corporate bond, and is not significant for a securitized bond. And that got me thinking, why is that? Why is it that an ESG event occurs and different classes of securities react differently? Interesting question. We're going to look at that further in a minute. Um, and this is a case study of that, uh, briefly. This is, this is uh, Sally May. This is a U.S. Uh, listed company and now has a different name. They had an ESG event in 2014, and um, uh, they were not treating. Uh, Sally May um, is is a, a company sponsored by the U.S. government that makes loans and facilitates financial products to students to help them finance their journeys. Very appropriate talking, you know, talking to business school students. And what we see is the blue line is the equity of this, this company, which even though it's government supported, it has actually common equity. Um, and the blue line is hit. And we see this big drawdown in valuation. And Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is a real lightning rod in, in Washington, introduces legislation to allow refinance of these programs. And, and, and it's clearly a very serious ESG event. And what we see is that impact on equity. We see a modest impact on its triple B, uh, double B corporate bond. That's the green, green line. Valuation decline of about 3% or 4% maybe. And then what we see is the securitizations that they issue, which are backed by the student loans, aren't affected at all. It's kind of odd. And we see exactly the same thing with Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is the second biggest bank in the United States. It's a massive trillion dollar commercial bank. Uh, they have... They had in 2016 terrible practices with respect to organized mis-selling of loans to retail to, to consumers in California. And this news came out, and Elizabeth Warren again was on their case. Um, this is 2016. This week, the U.S. government now is talking about a further billion-dollar fine linked to this issue. So these issues just don't go away. They just keep coming back. But as of 2016, before the billion dollar fine was discussed this week, was a $190 million fine to settle accusations that push customers into fee generating checking accounts. So, they could, so and you, you had to sell eight of these things every day. That was your goal as a Wells Fargo staff member in California in a branch. After this happened, we see the equity of Wells Fargo hit and we see the debt products um, really not hit as much. Why is that? And then we have Ford Motor, and it's well known, well known set of issues that it's faced, uh, linked to airbags. And ESG event happens. 2016 was a was a bad year for ESG, obviously. ESG events happening, and again we see the drawdown in equity and relative stability in debt products. So as an investing person, and uh, as running running an FCA regulated asset manager at Channel Capital, why is that? And it kind of got me thinking. This would be a great thing to do a research paper on or maybe pursue in a, in a doctorate one day. And uh, the more I looked at it, and I went back to the literature, um, as we do in academia, you think about what's the value of a business linked to revenue, operating margin, investment efficiency, cost of capital. These are all inputs into the value of a business. And then we have these ESG events. These ESG events can hit, I'll introduce a word here, the channels of transmission 
cost of capital, investment efficiency, operating margin, and revenue growth um, uh, quite a bit. So just drill down on this some more. So when we think about linkages to performance, we can think about equity, we can think about debt. We need to think about corporate performance in the context of revenue opportunities, the impact to society, maybe they could get fined. British Petroleum uh, and, and what it did in the Gulf, it had a record of issues, okay, in health and safety. Not Royal Dutch Shell, it was BP. But guess what? BP had a major issue, which affects society uh, that lived lived in the Gulf, lived near the Gulf of Mexico. Environment, productivity, investment, cost, regulation, and ESG strategy. All of these are linkages to performance, and there's a nice YouTube link there. And these metrics, E, S, and G, can be further broken down. Uh, and 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 you know, people like Gerard and I, who enjoy doing research and enjoy uh, empirical research, um, can go and we can try to measure these things. We can break these these uh, these break these things down. These metrics, we can we can create variables, and we can look at. For example, I'll just choose one in the S category at the top there, S1, CEO pay ratio. And I think, if I remember, that means you look at the average pay of a company uh, channel and you look at my pay. Um, and the ratio might be one to two. But if you go to other firms, for example, and you look at that ratio, uh, it may be that the CEO is paid 10, 12 times in the UK. And in America, that ratio can just jump up. Um, and that's just, just one, one bit of information. But if you combine it with this other data, it can begin to tell us a lot about ESG metrics and, 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 and give us prediction capabilities about future potential problems. Um, and certainly this can generate hypotheses for research. Before we continue, let's acknowledge the limitations that people like Dowie, I'm sure she's going to talk about this, that she faces. Uh, in her work, and, and, and we at Channel Face and, and anyone in ESG. The limitations, guess what? Data, data, data. ESG scores, you can go buy a score from a company. Um, they're opaque. Uh, the methodologies can be, can be skewed. Um, you can have companies that have good scores, and they're not necessarily good companies. So you need to be attuned to this. Uh, and I mentioned the data. This is a, a down below. I, this is a quote I've been using uh, for a while since 2020 about Tesla. Uh, is far from having great ES is, is is far from having great ESG ratings and scores, produces highly efficient scores on one hand, but it has very uh, has several sustainability issues, including the environmental impact of its batteries, poor working conditions, and this is the part I love today in 2022, two years after this was said, the eccentric and unusual governance practices of Mr. Elon Musk. Hmm. And these are our three channels of transmission, the cash flow channel, the, the systematic uh, risk channel, and company-specific or idiosyncratic risk channel. And this is the way that, that um, it quite, it quite uh, resonates with me. And we can think about these three channels, and, and you have here MSCI and their, their various ratings for ESG. And you can think about these channels as transmitting positive or negative value to a company's performance. And here we have, you know, really a very simple at the bottom, again from MSCI, a DCI model framework, and we have these specific types of channel of transmission, channels of transmission, and that can impact cash flow, that can hit a stock specific risk channel, and that can hit the valuation channel. Um, so this is one way to approach it, is again that incident occurs, and the reason why we might see equity hit more uh, rather than debt, is there's other mitigants for the debt or the securitizations that mitigate the impact of these channels upon that security valuation. So this begins to, you start to, you can begin to hypothesize and you begin to test this assumption. This is also from MSCI, 2017, quite old, but it, the, the, the message is clear that firms that have lower ESG ratings from an MSCI perspective have more volatility. So this is sort of consistent with our earlier case studies, and we've seen that. And the reason why perhaps, and the way I think of it is, 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 is debt seems more stable, securitization or senior bonds, when there's an ESG event, is, could be tied, hypothetically tied, to, to the Merton, the old-fashioned 74 D to D, the distance to default model, which I, I love looking at and thinking about a lot. 
And just in my own words, it's obviously saying, how many terms of ROI does it take that if you remove that ROI, you remove that value for company, you would put it in default? What's that distance to default? And that's, there's a formula for that. We can do the formula and we can run that in stata and statistical models and we can measure one company's D to D versus another. And if you think about it for a minute, um, and this, this is again coming out of MSCI, credit to them, that, that Merton framework can be tied back to this channels of transmission. These are essentially, you could be stressing the Merton framework for these channels of transmission. And you can think about um, its impact upon volatility and firm valuation very easily. Um, and then when you think about securitizations, I don't want to talk about securitizations, we only have two or three minutes to go, um, but we can think about um, a securitization um, is a removal of an asset from a company. It could be a receivable or it could be a loan. Wells Fargo does loan securitizations. We saw there was no impact after the ESG event on the valuation of its loan securitizations, its consumer loan securitizations, the removal of loans to an SPV, and the SPV issues bonds to investors around the world. And these things are in the billions and billions. And we know how that works. We, we, we move those loans on an SPV. But what we see is the role of a backup servicer keeping an eye on things, of a trustee, of investors keeping an eye on things. You can see the role of a program manager. And all of these actors, okay, are mitigants to the impact to the channel of transmission. They're keeping an eye on things. And, and, and the way Brown Brothers lays it out, there's a company called Amer Equipment Finance, just a company. And the way Brown Brothers, this is again Brown Brothers information, and I, I love what they do, and, and, and we've tweaked it ourselves, is that you can have a pool of leases. So we're going to think, what's the ESG risk with Amer? This is a company, equipment finance company at the bottom of the logo. And you can own its equity maybe if it's a public company, or you can buy its debt. But at the securitization level, we have a pool of leases. We have legal opinions, we have lawyers involved, we have robust reps and warranties, we have a backup service or the bus. Then we have a granular pool of 2,700 separate companies that Amer has lent money to. Now we can remove that and put that in the, in the, in the SPV. So we're mitigating the risk of Amer somewhat because of the role of the leases. There's 2,700 of them, there are other companies, there's other actors involved as we said earlier. Um, and then there's independent trustee, funny enough, coincidentally, by Wells Fargo, but just ignore that for a minute. Um, so what we're finding is that different securities, equity, senior debt, and the securitization structure has different levels of ESG risk. And, and these products, these securities, have different sensitivity to an ESG event. And then lastly, on page 20, my very last slide here is just a heat map, again, put together by Brown Brothers Harriman, which is a well-known ABS investor. And they've actually looked at this, and they have their own heat map, where they're saying green is low ESG risk, or very low risk, light green is low, yellow is moderate, and then bright red is severe. What they're saying is that the, where you see red, so whole business securitization, it's effectively a corporate bond. It's a single issuer securitization, it's a corporate bond, and it's exposed to the same shocks that you might have um, with a corporate bond. So therefore you get the red that you're seeing there at the bottom. So this is just, again, as we go back to the beginning, um, what we're saying here is that as an investor in fixed income products, equity, securitizations, uh, it's, 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 it's our opinion, it's definitely best to consider ESG we're doing good, possibly, especially if you can have an impact on an issuer, but it's also being smart.